as we've been telling you, President Biden is heading overseas to meet with NATO leaders. Our Leland Vitter joining me now. Uh, Leland, good morning to you. I know you've been pulling some long nights, so I'm even more appreciative of you joining us. Um, aside from reassuring U.S. allies, what does Biden hope to accomplish with this trip? From a political standpoint, it's a great way for President Biden to be seen as being presidential and commander in chief. And there's nothing more presidential than flying in uh, to an area not far from where the Russian military is to lead NATO. So uh, for a White House that's struggling to get a win, uh, heading over and having this conference is certainly a nice way to have a win. And we heard uh, in Joe Khalil's uh, interview with Senator Manchin that the, the White House and Democrats are really trying to push this narrative that President Biden has brought NATO and brought Europe together and has brought NATO back uh, and has brought NATO back together and strengthened the alliance. So this is the chance to showcase that. Uh, th that narrative has got some problems to it. Uh, and there's some questions in, is in terms of, of whether or not he's going to be able to go over to Brussels and come back with any real deliverables uh, in, in that sense. But th that would probably be why the White House is so willing to send him. It seems to a lot of folks that what Zelensky is asking for, including what he's expected to talk about in his congressional address, including the no-fly zone, would be exactly something that Russia would want to have happen, maybe to justify making war on other countries, mm -hmm. including NATO allies. Any, any justification of that thought? Well, that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And the, the White House has been pretty clear that their policy is that of not provoking Putin. Uh, and the overarching question of everything that we've done with Ukraine and every question in every action the White House has taken is whether or not to provoke Putin. And uh, I thought the, the senator earlier made a sort of a curious statement when he said, well, we have to make sure all our NATO allies are on board with everything we do. They are. You've got Estonia already asking for a no-fly zone. You've got Poland offering MiG-29 jets. You've got the Brits saying we need to send more advanced weaponry. And it's the White House that's always pulling the reins. So to sit there and say, well, you know, it's, it, NATO has to be united. NATO is united. It's the United States that's holding back. And I uh, was on the radio earlier today talking about it. And I find it really curious why the White House is always telegraphing that their main concern is provoking Putin, because if Putin knows that, then he is going to act aghast and provoked by absolutely everything. There's just a Wall Street Journal article that came out um, calling into question this this talking point from the administration that we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory. Uh, there's been at least two incidents now of Russian drones flying into NATO airspace that weren't shot down. Uh, and that really begs the question of how much Vladimir Putin is trying to test NATO. And so far, uh, to use the, the old Russian saying, you stick the bayonet into flesh. And if it keeps going, you wait until you hit something hard. So far, Vladimir Putin has not hit anything hard. Mm. You make some really good points there. What else does the U.S. have to actually offer Ukraine uh, besides the billions of dollars in humanitarian and military aid? Well, let's be clear. Vladimir Putin doesn't care about humanitarian aid to Ukraine or helping the Ukrainian people. That makes us feel better. That uh, is a moral obligation if you want to go that far, because we did, after all, <laughs> promise the Ukrainians that we would secure their borders back in 1994 when they gave up their nukes. So put all that aside. Uh, it's not how much we give in terms of, of money in military hardware. It's what we give. And that that in, is the rub here, is whether or not the United States is willing to provide weapons to the Ukrainians that will make a difference, enough of a difference on the battlefield to make Vladimir Putin think twice about continuing this war. And we go back to where this all starts. White House organizing principle, don't provoke Putin. Those two things can't happen at once. You can't not provoke Putin and at the same time give Vladimir Zelensky the weapons he needs to punish Vladimir Putin enough that he backs off. Leland Vitter, thank you as always for your insights. Uh, you can watch On Balance with Leland every weeknight on News Nation at 7 Eastern Time, 6 Central. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to click on the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.